I am really excited to be here today with Father John Beadle, who is a priest in the Anglican Church of North America and a church planter with a singular focus on that. And, uh, and I, I, I met Father John through Twitter, which is kind of fun. And he made a comment on Twitter a while back that really struck me that it fit right into my channel. So I reached out to him and asked if he would talk to me about this. He, he made this comment that magic reveals reality and that the Harry Potter series tells the story of Christ. So I thought, okay, I've got to learn what I can from this guy. So Father John, would you tell me a little bit about your story, how you grew up, um, how you came to faith and, you know, what were the bumps along the way and then yeah. where you're at today? Sure. Uh, wow. Okay. What a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always um, interested in the bumps along the way because obviously that's where we learn and grow. So, right. Like, what uh, is life even fun without suffering? Um, anyway, <laughs> well, it's so good to be with you. And uh, I've enjoyed our interactions on Twitter, I don't know, over the last, I guess, six months or so. And it's just nice to actually get to kind of sort of see you in person and, and, and some, some, spend some time with you on your channel here. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Louisiana, actually. So I'm, I'm in Texas now, and I've been in Texas just over half my life. So I like to like to say like I'm Texan, but, but I actually grew up in Louisiana. My dad and my mom met in college at LSU in Baton Rouge. And my dad grew up Roman Catholic. My mom grew up Presbyterian. She's actually a, the daughter of a Presbyterian minister. So my grandfather was like a big, you know, I mean, really into the PCUSA world on the one hand, kind of stuffy, uh, Calvinistic kind of world. And then on the other hand, like a huge fan of Elvis would play the banjo unprompted <laughs> and uh, really good at the violin. So that is sort of uh, the world that I, that I uh, grew up in in my family, uh, my dad being like a big computer engineer guy, my mom being a musician, artist, like the, you know, two halves of a brain coming together in our family. Uh, but when they were in college, both my parents had radical encounters with, with the Lord Jesus. And uh, in, the, in the form of, really it was the 80s. So it was when the Holy Spirit kind of moved into the in colleges and there was all this like kind of energy around revival and uh, around prayer that was new for a lot of people, even who had grown up in the church. They kind of left those traditions and raised us. I'm one of five boys. I'm the oldest. Um, just want to say I'm the oldest. I like saying it. Um, so yeah, one <laughs> of my boys. Certain cred, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got to put that out there that, you know, this is, this is where, this is by providence. God chose me first. So anyway, um, so yeah, they, <laughs> uh, my parents, you know, raised us in an actual, like a small town called Kinder, uh, Louisiana, which is like right down the street from the Casino Cachata, it's like population 2000 people, uh, really small town. And the reason that I bring that up is because, you know, when I was, I was born in Baton Rouge, but my, all my other brothers were born closer to the town we lived in. Uh, my parents went to a conference in this little church and were the kind of people who were like, well, if the Holy Spirit's moving here, we're going to, we're going to move our whole family here. And so I, I kind of grew up in this rough and tumble sort of kind of spirituality where it's all about like the gifts of the spirit and the power of God and miracles and signs and wonders and, and this sort of amazing kind of mystical uh, faith where God was always doing things, but culturally we were kind of small. So like we, we, we always went to church and experienced God and the power of God. And that was amazing. But like our, our cultural influences a focus on the arts and things like that were, were still very small. Uh, I would say. Um, so things like Harry Potter would have never been on the radar. I mean, it just, it, I didn't even know about it until it was like probably book four or five, uh, just for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Cause that's just, we just listened to Christian music and we didn't, we weren't allowed to listen to the secular. So there was like this sharp divide between the secular and the sacred. Right. And, um, like, so what happens with so many kids who grew up in more fundamentalist evangelical households, I guess, um, but I still had, I had a great childhood and I still, you know, love my parents. My parents gave me a faith that like could endure. And I appreciate that. Um, and then right as I was about to go into high school, my dad and my, my mom sat us down and said, um, 
you know, we're going bankrupt. Uh, the mortgage hasn't been paid in six months and the bank is repossessing the house. And that was, I think, the moment where everything shifted um, in our family, completely shifted, where we were this, again, this small kind of culturally small uh, world. And then we went into this place where we were suffering. We were just like, we lost a house, lost a car, lost, uh, um, had to move somewhere else to like where it was more affordable um, and had to learn how to survive. And, and that was different. Um, a, a, a big change occurring, right? And as a result, I think God used that experience to just, just pull our whole family out of the sort of prosperity gospel, you know, uh, sort of uh, folksy Christianity that we had kind of become accustomed to and into deeper things uh, because God had allowed us to suffer. You know, it wasn't like we lacked faith. It was just uh, we were bumping up against the world and experiencing um, a transformation that we never asked for. And that had sort of like presented itself to us as a problem in the world. And then we had to sort of enter into it. And so then through that, my dad got a job in Houston. So when I was 15, 15 years old, I'm 33 now. So uh, when I was 15, though, we moved to Houston for my dad's job. And that totally opened up our world completely. Um, it's been a season at Lakewood Church where Joel Steen's the pastor. Um, <laughs> which I know shocks a lot of people because typically like Lakewood doesn't produce priests. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it, it was the first church I'd ever been a part of where like people were just like playing music a lot. And there was just a lot of that. So I got into music, sort of playing guitar, leading worship in that world. And I'm kind of just giving you the little, you know, blips along the way, but, um, but I wouldn't say I was really like a strong Christian until I was about 18, 19 years old. Uh, when some guys in the area um, got a Bible study together just for young adult guys, just average age was like 20 years old. And we just started praying together, like in an apartment, this one bedroom apartment right here in the woodlands. And, and I would say that was probably the first time that I had ever felt like my faith was my own and that I could, I could ex expand those boundaries and read more widely. I just hadn't growing up. I never read you know, literature. I didn't read anything um, until I, I would say until God encountered me when I was 19. And it was through that experience that I was going through a, an addiction to um, pornography. And I was like, struggling with all these different, these, all these different identity crisis things, mm -hmm. um, sexual identity and stuff like that. I mean, it's just pretty common with people who live on the internet. Right. And so, um, yeah, through that, I would say that that God really like just completely just grabbed a hold of my heart. And I re and I just kind of became like, I felt like a different person. And, um, and I just became a reader like overnight. And I just started consuming anything and everything I could get my hands on related to God. Uh, then started a campus ministry not long after that um, with some friends that kind of blew up and got us noticed by some pastors in the area who were like, what are these, these college students doing? And, where are they, who are they affiliated with? And that, that caused me to reevaluate where I was going to church. And so I started attending a local charismatic church that I was helping filter my friends into and uh, what got into that whole world for a number of years with the IHOP and the Bethel guys and, hmm. and was, was like really invested in that. And then I got married while I was still in that world my wife Lauren we have three kids now by the way six, uh Declan who's six Lynn, Lennon who's three and then August who's six months old they're awesome hmm. but um the birth of my son transformed my life again like it was another moment where it was like the bankruptcy where it was like everything is new and different because um we had a horrible experience at a church we were on staff at and we ended up leaving abruptly <laughs> And uh, just a few days later, my wife had a seizure. That seizure uh, put her to sleep for two hours. When she woke up, she called me and said, I don't want you to freak out, but I just had a seizure. I was like, uh, I'm coming to get you right now. Um, picked her up. And then, then we had our son two and a half months ahead of time. So 
And then he was then and then he survived. Lauren survived. And he was in the NICU for just over a month. And when he was at four pounds, we could take him home. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a shorter, obviously a shorter version of that part piece of the story because it was in that, uh, it was really that moment where it felt like we could go either way. Like we could either say, we're done with this God thing. It's over. And actually I stopped praying. Um, I was always like a big prayer guy. But then I felt like I just got betrayed, you know, and I felt like my life was over. And so I was ready just to kind of like, I was kind of in a place where I wanted to call it quits. I wasn't praying. My wife was kind of in a place where she didn't know if she wanted to even do the Christian thing anymore. Um, it was just a lot of trauma, I would say. And then um, Sunday rolled around and I was just like, I'm just a Christian kid, you know, raised my whole life in church. I got to go to church. I feel like I need to go somewhere. And not only do I feel like I need to go somewhere, I feel like I need to take communion. And I had been reading, again, still like a voracious reader. I've been reading N.T. Wright a lot and uh, was exposed to the Anglican world through him. And I also had realized at that moment, like most of my favorite writers were Anglican. So it was kind of like a little funny, a little, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. And so I knew there was an Anglican church down the road and I knew they did communion every Sunday. And if I just went, I could just receive. And, and I said, I could do that. And so we began to attend and then we felt like God encountered us one, one morning, one Sunday morning through the taking of Holy Eucharist in such a, and it was such a powerful encounter that we felt like, like God was going to rebuild our lives through this experience. Mm -hmm. And we could do that here at that church. And we didn't know exactly what we believed anymore about God. Um, you know, the tenets of the faith or whatever, but, but we knew that we could enter into communion. And years later, I look back and I go, well, I could, I knew that I could enter into the mystery associated with that, with God, with the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Like I knew that I could, I could do, and somehow it needed to be more than symbolic for me to say yes to it. And uh, it couldn't just represent something else like that we were, and we were being taught this, right? That, that somehow in some mysterious way, the grace of God inhabits the elements themselves. When you take them, that you receive that grace into yourself by faith and with thanksgiving as the, as the liturgy says. So we, we started realizing we could, we were build that God was building our faith around mystery and not certainty. So mm -hmm. that our faith would not rest, like Paul says in First Corinthians two, which has been like my, my my life passage lately. Like he says, you know, I, when I came to you, I did not come to you and per, you know persuasive persuasive words or cleverness, but uh, in the spirit and power, so that our faith would no longer rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And it was it was sort of one of those moments. And so through that, um, our bishop was also the senior pastor. He would just ask me questions like are you going to, uh, where are you going to school after you graduate, you know, from Sam Houston state? I'm like, I'm probably going to law school. And he's like, would you consider seminary? I'm like, yeah, I'll consider it. Okay. I'll do it. Like that's, <laughs> that's my heart's desire. That's what I always wanted. And I, I, I couldn't admit it to myself until I had someone saying, have you thought about this? I'm like, yeah, actually a lot. No, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, totally. Um, and then through that process, you know, becoming an ordinan, postulant, aspirant, and postulant. We go through the phases of ordination, right? So they're, they're like, do you want to be, you know, a priest one day? And I'm like, I think God's bringing me that, you know, bringing me into that direction. They're like, great, here's all you have to do. Get a master's degree. <laughs> um, oh, just that. Okay, get that. Okay, yeah, go through the process. It's going to take like three years to go through the process on top of like your education. Oh, and take this test, get a psych evaluation. So they just, you know, went through that whole process. It was really difficult. I was working full time during the and working part time at the church and in seminary and doing all of that. Uh, eventually became a priest and being a father and a husband. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, making sure my marriage survived seminary, which doesn't always happen for guys. So just try not to let my uh, my my life and my marriage get shipwrecked on the shores of seminary. Um. And then so it just became apparent about six months ago that 
to apparent to us and to our bishop that church planning was the next step for our family. And uh, I've, that's always been me. I've always been, I felt like uh, where I get a lot of life is like on the edge, you know, as a, as a forerunner, like doing a new work, um, believing in people. Um, I just, I just believe in people. So uh, it's, am I, I'm an evangelist at heart. So my desire is always to sort of like, emanate this like love for Christ because that's who I am and so that's what I'm doing right now is I'm I mean you've got me at a, at a moment where I'm moving my family to the very place that we're going to be uh, planting so we're going to live in the, in the neighborhood that we're trying to reach and um, not the best neighborhood but it is that's where we're going because that's the people that God's called us to reach now is that still going to be in Texas yeah we're just you know we're just going north to a place called Conroe Conroe, which is like a, an older, it's older than the woodlands where my parents live and where our cathedral church is. It's about uh, 15, 20 minutes away. Hmm. Yeah. And there's like nothing there is there. Um, there's almost, there's like really no, at least a Anglican, like ACNA church between the woodlands and Dallas. It doesn't, there's really nothing there. And so we're just, we just see a need and, and we feel like God's saying, go fill it. So that's what we're going to do. I was yeah. hoping you would be moving near my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but almost nobody comes to California because it's just too darn expensive to make the change. So, <clears throat> yeah, you have a, um, there's a great diocese there. Uh, I think it's the Diocese of San Joaquin. Um, Bishop, I forget the guy's name, but I think they were, I, um, I got to look that up. They were experiencing a similar problem. It's like, it's one thing when, you know, you, calling priests to move to California right now is, is really difficult to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For all those reasons that you're not saying, yeah. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, if right. the church, if the church doesn't have, um, um, now I forget the word <laughs> it's been so long since I used it, that the house that's attached to the, Oh, to a parsonage, the, a parsonage. If the church yeah. doesn't have a parsonage, um, there's like, no way. I, I became a Christian in a tiny little church, a country church in Iowa that had a, the history of it was as a, um, an old style um, um, oh, good heavens, friends, old style friends church. Oh, wow. And uh, but by the time I had started going to that church, they had kind of gone non-denominational and the mm. pastor that they had brought in had been a, a missionary to the Navajo Indians for 20 years. Wow. So, so it was a very unusual mix because the old style friends didn't really have much in the way of preaching. They would just all come together and wait upon the spirit, right. right. And let the spirit right. speak. And then they brought in this pastor who, um, Anyway, it was a wonderful place to become a Christian and to grow in Christ. And the sense of community there was just so full and rich. And, and because it, it was the only place within about a five town area where there actually was rich faith going on, there were a lot of other churches, but they were mostly nominal. Then it, it drew from all these five towns and, and a lot of people from, as that, it, it, this was in that wave in the early 80s when there was a lot of revival going on. That revival was happening at this church because it was bringing in people from all these other dead churches. So mm. even some of the charismatic churches and Catholic churches in the area, those people were starting to come to this little church. And um, so I knew people from many, many different denominations. It was a great place to start. Yeah. And I can't remember why I was telling you about, oh, they had a parsonage. Now oh, there you go. there's a, there's a pro because it was out in the country. And so they had given the pastor this house to live in. The problem with that is he was at that church for 27 years. So they just retired. Well, I want to say 10 years ago or so. And when he retired, he had no equity. Yeah, right. He has no, exactly. um, and he had no retirement because it's a tiny little church. They can't pay him a retirement. So he went to oh. work as a truck driver. Oh no. And so he and his wife were doing cross country truck trucking now. They're in their 70s and they're still doing yeah. cross country country trucking. That is the uh, that's that's amazing. Um I know that a lot of it's kind of old school. You you really don't see parsonage anymore for that very reason. Mm -hmm. That like you're saying guys can't retire and they don't have equity. 
so what they'll do now is like, you know, they'll, they'll pay a, a priest uh, a salary and then the, the priest will claim part of that salary as like a housing allowance. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the way that, that, you know, in a modern sense, guys have kind of gotten around that where it's like, okay, well, here's a bunch of non-taxable income. And then that'll be like the parsonage allowance. Mm-hmm. And then whatever remains is what would typically be paid of a pastor because, I mean, I'm sure this pastor, I don't know what his salary would have been. It's kind of it's not exactly a meaning code conversa- type of conversation yeah. to have. But um, <laughs> if, you know, if he was living on the, on, the, on the church property, I can imagine that his salary was probably really small. It was. But, yeah. then, but then, right. Uh, but then the justification is, well, we, you live here for free. So, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's just kind of, I mean, unless you're like in England in like the 19th century and they're, you know you're like the landed gentry because you're, you know, you're like the third, you know, you're, you're the third child who can't inherit anything from your parents. So they just put you in the church here. You can have, you can have a parsonage, you can have land you live on. It's not, mm-hmm. It doesn't really work like that anymore. So. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to the Levites, right? Their portion was the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And well, they took so, care of them. so I'm, I'm really, um, I, I just, I, I'm writing down all these places where our lives intersect <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me want to go back and rewrite a little bit of the story of my own life about all the places where I learned these things about um, having a mystical kind of faith, a, a mystery, having a faith based on mystery rather than certainty. Yeah. Because even though I was in and out of a lot of churches that might now be very locked in certainty at the time I was in them, there was plenty of room for mystery. And uh, in all of the experiences that I had, all these bumps in the road, all these times of falling into the abyss Mm. um, were times that that God just taught me so many rich and deep lessons. Yeah. Um, But I want to talk to you about your idea that magic reveals reality because i have and i've been talking about this on my channel quite a bit lately my um i have kind of a theory (laughs) that i've been trying to flesh out about um what reality actually is and how reality functions and how we function within reality and so i've been kind of on this path of looking at things and uh while I was on the path, I happened upon this book that somebody recommended on the incarnation mm. by St. Yeah. Athanasius. Have you read it by any chance? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. So on page 31, there's a little quote here that might get you started on your discussion of magic. He's talking about why the incarnation was necessary. Mm. Okay. I mean, obviously, that's what the whole book is about. <clears throat> right, right. But on on page thirty one, he's um, he's talking about those who had fallen into such sin that that there was no hope for them to come back from that without something happening. For example, they sacrificed brute beasts and immolated men as the just due of their deities, thereby bringing themselves more and more under their insane control. Magic arts also were taught among them. Oracles in sundry places led men astray. And the cause, I thought this was so modern. The cause of everything in human life was traced to the stars as though nothing existed, but that which could be seen. You know, I mean, that, I mean, that's the way it is today, right? We can trace yeah. everything back to the stars. They're, they're always talking about how the, the uh, atoms that are in me once were in a star someplace. And then that's mm-hmm. all there is. That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and, and of course, this was written back in 300 and something. So it's always so interesting to me how much those guys knew. They were so smart. I feel the same way about Augustine. You know, when I, when I first read Confessions, I was like struck by how modern he sounds. Mm-hmm. And it's that, I think it's really that generation, you know, of guys who are just articulating Christianity in a fresh way amidst the pagans, you know, amidst like pagan idolatry. Um, I mean, I can launch right into it. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Ath- Athanasius is right, obviously. Um, he's almost always right, but um, the incarnation for me unlocks, well, for the church, the incarnation unlocks reality. 
to the to the world. So you read like Galatians and Paul says, Abraham had the gospel preached to him. And then he quotes, he quotes the passage where Abraham hears the gospel. And the, the passage is that he would be a blessing to all nations. So it's God's covenant with Abraham. Um, unlocks beyond the exclusivity of Israel to the nations. Um, and so in, the incarnation is like, and in a way, and it's going to be a sound weird to some, I, I, can, I can hear people like getting confused, like an incantation, uh, a true magic word spoken over reality is the arrival of the word of God into the world. And so, and I, I say that boldly because some people are going to be confused when they hear the words like incantation next to incarnation or whatever. Well, I mean, uh, because I, that's, I, I'm going to just jump in here for a second. How can it be anything different? Right. Because the word was spoken and the, the world came into being. So, that's right. I mean, that that's yes. an incantation, right? I mean, yes. And, exactly. And, I and mean, the incarnation uh, is the is the redoing of creation. So that's right. You can't. That's right. Exactly. It is. It is the. Uh, I, I said this during our. Um, we had lessons in Carol service. You know, it's like the, like the the incarnation is the hinge, of the door, that was about to shut on humanity, and so all of a sudden this thing appears like this Christ appears, and the door swings wide open the other direction. So it be, and it begins to happen, and it doesn't begin to happen at the cross, although it is made it is, right. It's made clear at the cross that of what was you know retro, you know what was happening at the incarnation, but it begins at the incarnation. It doesn't begin at the cross or resurrection. It begins there, but it is made fully alive and complete in the incarnate in uh, the resurrection and the cross. But I think this that's is so the thing I wish that Jordan Peterson could catch because one yeah. of the things that that I caught right away when I was listening to his biblical series, at some point he makes a comment about Jesus Christ being the hinge of history. And I, I just thought, wow, he can see that, but, but he's seeing the symbolic nature of Christ's life, but he's not seeing the, the absolute necessity of the incarnation and the death yeah. and the resurrection as being right. all part of that thing that the resurrection is an important part of that hinge right see this is what really i love about peterson and and don't like don't love about peterson this is what you just said because i think on the one hand he gets that that all of this is symbolic like that's true mm -hmm. like it's true a symbol just says Absolutely. right like it's yeah it's like a token it's like the face on the tokens is is caesar's face and that represents that it, it shows you this is this represents the real thing so there's power to that that I think is true. It's, it's true. But because he cannot make the leap into entering into that mystery in a sacramental sense that deepens the symbolic reality of what he's talking about, um, it sort of, to me, it creates like a limit on, on what he can, what he really says about the church and about Christianity at large in a way that like, I think people like Chesterton, you know, L Lewis, they just get it. Like they just get that part especially well, you know? So when you read like the Chronicles of Narnia and, you know, Aslan is explaining to the kids why he rose from the dead. He does, he says, okay, the witch understood this level of magic that is symbolic, right? One has to die because one did this. Like it's a symbolic world. That's true, right? So that, that level of magic is true. But he says, actually, there's a it, before the world even began, there was a deeper incantation spoken over it. Mm -hmm. That whenever one lays their an innocent person lays down their life for one who is not innocent, it reverses the process of death itself. So right there is what I, I guess what really frustrates me about Peterson is, I mean, obviously he's not a Christian, really. He's a cultural Christian. He's an agnostic. Um, he's an evolutionary, uh, you know, thinker. Everything essentially comes back to evolution for him. I had a buddy who was at Cambridge when he was there and got to speak with Peterson and basically just, I mean, had a very direct conversation about this. I think Peterson's a really good, like, uh, man of peace and an open door that many people have walked through for, to encounter Christ. I just, but I think this, this bit here is what's missing. And I'm glad you brought it up because I'm like, this, 
we have to transcend the symbolic world and then beyond the symbolic is true participation. So that's what we're invited into truly. And I think people, uh, you know, like Peterson, like he feels around in the dark for it and people who follow him do as well. And they, they encounter and they participate maybe without realizing it, but it's, I think it's just helpful to name it. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I, I had a I had a thought this morning as I I I'm way too propositional in my thinking, so I'm always having to pull myself back from the edge of becoming too propositional because oh. <laughs> I'm always I'm always building systems in my head. Yeah. Oh, well, this pattern matches that pattern. Well, this pattern matches that pattern, and then all of a sudden I have a system built up of all these patterns, and I'm like, no, right. no, no, you got you to stop <laughs> that. But I, I'm just going to throw this pattern out to you and show you something um you know that we're that my little corner of the world here is also part of paul vanderclay's kind of orbit and uh he's awesome yeah and in that he has also been connected up with john verveke who has the um you familiar with john verveke no I, not at all oh okay well john verveke is um also from toronto ontario also a uh, uh, professor of, I want to say, uh, cognitive science, cognitive oh. psychology. And he is also, he calls himself not a non-theist because oh. he doesn't want to call himself an atheist. And he doesn't really want to call himself an agnostic. So he calls himself a non-theist. But he has, um, he did a whole series on something called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, 50 episodes on YouTube, where he goes through the entire history of thought from the very beginning until now. And, wow. and in the more recent episodes of that, he talks about cognitive science and what they've discovered about how the mind and the brain work and how that all fits in with human connection and all of these wow. things. It's very interesting stuff. One of the things that he came up with is a certain way of looking at knowledge that's he, he says that there are four ways that we know they're called the four p's mm. procedural perspectival propositional and participatory and the participatory is the highest of those that it grows out of these other three basically mm. that when, yeah. once you've laid the groundwork with the procedural the perspectival and propositional the participatory is what kind of caps all of that. <clears throat> so that's one pattern is what John Verveke is talking about. Another pattern is I had written in my notes the other day from something I was listening to, three things that stuck out to me, hmm. patterns of action, stories, and propositions. And as I was looking at those three this morning, I thought, well, that's basically what God's word is made up of is patterns of action, yep. stories and propositions. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then, then that fell into place with all these other threes that I think about the way, the truth and the life, but, but okay. Patterns of action are the way do it this way. The procedural that's the patterns of action. The, the, propositions are the truth believe this because it's true these are the propositions mm. and the life is the stories okay so then i got to thinking about that pattern and i thought okay so goodness beauty and truth mm. the way the truth and the life goodness truth and beauty if goodness is the way and truth is the truth then the life is the beauty the stories mm. is the beauty the story is where the beauty shows up right yeah. and the beauty is is how we enjoy and how we are transformed by the life of the holy spirit within us mm. so then love expresses love starts out as participatory because of the relation of father son and holy spirit true yeah for the beginning of time right and then love expresses 
into time through patterns of action, propositions and stories in the word. And, and that is love expressing himself through truth, goodness, truth and beauty. And then out of that arrives the participatory because the incarnation is the participation with man on man's level in humanity, right? So the procedural, perspectival, and the propositional all build up into this participatory thing. And so when that kind of blew up in my head, I went, oh my goodness, <laughs> I got to tell somebody. I like so, it. So as a, as a priest in the Anglican Church of North America, you can hold me to the fire on whether or not that is um, biblically consistent. Um, well, just based on what you said so far, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to get like, you know, things, you know, going off in my brain. So I, I think, yes, I think that's this. So this is the center of the, of our worshiping life. The very center of our Sunday morning worshiping life is the Holy Eucharist in the Eucharist itself, the bread and the wine. It begins in participation, right? Okay. That's there certainly. And that's the point. Right. The point is not even the point of the Christian life is not to do missions. It's not even to do it to do any of that. The point is to worship. So that's our telos. That's our goal. So we utilize propositions because because God does. I mean, he get put that he puts gives us reason mm -hmm. and uh, we utilize story because that's how he gave us his word. That's how he gave us himself. And that's who we are in human as human nature. That's the. And I was thinking about Peterson this morning because I was um, I was digging into some of your uh, your catalog here, and I, I noticed you talked a lot about Peterson. And you know uh, what I love about him is that he's he's trying to reemphasize that which is permanent and that which is fixed, and restore that to a people like us, like millennials especially, who don't feel like anything's fixed and permanent. Everything is changing. So I think it's I think that's really powerful um, to say it the way you said it. I mean, to introduce people to the transcendentals that way is really good. As a priest, um, you know, that's what I'm always trying to do. I'm always trying to communicate truth. I'm always trying to catechize people into the into what is good and what is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so if you know, I think in the evangelical church we get this backwards. We think people are attracted to our worship. And then they're going to be, they're going to become one of us. But in the early church, especially there's a sense, you know, you held up on the incarnation by Athanasius, like they get this, like people aren't attracted to our worship. They're attracted to us. And the reason they get attracted to us is because of our worship. Right. So this is like something that I'm really like hammering home with people about. Uh, because as we have been transformed by the worship, which is what makes us attractive. Exactly. So like as Christians, especially um, if we have been, if we have truly received the truth, then we will be remade into something that is beautiful. Our lives will become beautiful. And that beauty yields the fruit of, I think, good, you know, of goodness. Um, and then that goodness releases people into the truth. Again, it's sort of this, you, I think you, you said it kind of in a cyclical way that participation is where mm -hmm. everything begins. Cause that's where love begins. Mm -hmm. Right. Like as a child, I don't, you know, like my kids, they don't know, they didn't know very much about me for a long time, you know, mm -hmm. like when they were born, the, but they didn't, their earliest knowledge as children is one of love and affection. If it's done, if it's done right, you know, pe some kids don't have that experience. Their earliest memories are not love and affection, but done the right way. That's, that's the earliest knowledge that we have is the knowledge of love. And then as we get older, we learn things. We learn propositions about the world, like things about the world that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just the journey of life is to get back to love um, again. And so you sort of have to go on this hero's journey where you begin in the Shire and you end in the Shire. You know, you're going to be like Sam. You know, most of us aren't Frodo. Most of us are Sam, right? So we have to go all the way back around just to go back home. You know, Chesterton said there's two ways to go home. You know, and one of them is to stay right where you are. So it's the same kind of principle at work, I think, that you're, you're, you're going to, if you truly are going to return to love, it's going to be a return. You're not going to go somewhere you've never been. You were born in love. 
and so yeah i think that's probably right um if i grasp what you're saying properly i think i think that that i get it then i think i do think it's right and to sort of and to give people categories of what you're doing i mean because i'm not really like this like i'm not a hugely propositional thinker <laughs> that's not really my my bag i mean i was a I was in the continental philosophy in college and, and I, I was more into that because I just hated, uh, I really didn't care for like logic or propositional thinking. I mean, honestly, I just love like the postmodern guys. I love talking about aesthetics and architecture and that was just more me, you know, cause I'm more of in my thinking an aesthetic thinker. I'm not really, um, uh, really good at math or, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing, <clears throat> but it's important that people have, all of these different, um, all these different ways of thinking about the world, so they can it makes sense of their suffering, and their and their experience, so they can get back to love. They can do that. They can make that transition, and you can almost always tell, like you said it earlier about yourself, you know that you you're so propositional that you have to sometimes pull yourself back from the ledge. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of learning these things about ourselves. How having the self-knowledge enough to know, okay, like for me, I can rely too much sometimes on, sometimes too much on experience and too much on um, sort of the aesthetic that I, I get, I don't, you know, I got to remind myself about, okay, what's the truth of this? What's the, what is the argument being made? And am I just swallowing it whole or am I actually being transformed by this in a, in a negative or a positive way? So giving people, um, ways to think through their experience is important probably more than more important now than ever um you know uh, and actually when you were talking i recently finished a book that i highly recommend um to, i would recommend this to everybody it's called uh, reading backwards by richard hayes reading backwards and uh anyway in that book you know this he's a new testament scholar and um those those who are in the NT right orbit really know who Richard Hayes is. He wrote a he wrote a book called uh, Moral uh, <clears throat> Moral Vision of the New Testament. That's like a textbook on this. It's really good. But this book uh, is short. It's like a hundred pages. And in the book, he talks about how figural reading is a literary. It's it's more in literature than than in New Testament studies these days. But when you look at the New Testament, you realize that it's the New Test. We don't interpret the New Testament really. The New Testament interprets the old. So that's really what's happening. And I think in a liter literary level, that's true. The New Testament sees itself clearly as an apocalyptic reading of the Old Testament. And that's a really like, you know, narrow statement, but I, I'll maybe I'll explain it and it'll make more sense. So like, you know, you, there are just, if you took out every allusion or direct reference to the Old Testament and the New Testament, you would have nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just riddled with the Old Testament. So he says, figural reading establishes two poles of connection. So you see this over and over again when Jesus says, you know, uh, Moses wrote about me in uh, John, I think it's John chapter four. He says, if you knew, if you knew, if you read Moses, you would know me right? Mm -hmm. um, statements like that are really strange if you're a, a Jew listening to Jesus at that time. That's a really strange statement, right? But then you start reading like you read back in Genesis and the flood narratives as, just as an example, and it says the ark was raised above the earth. And then you remember that like the snake in Exodus mm -hmm. that was raised <clears throat> above the people for their healing, and then you realize, wait a second, the ark is like this, this mercy and the waters represent like this judgment. And in John three, you remember that Jesus says, oh, and you start making these connections, right? You remember that Jesus says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. And whoever does not, whoever does not believe in the son, the wrath of God remains on him. And then you realize, wait a second. Oh, so the ark raised high above the earth is Christ. He was raised high above the earth. And those who do not find themselves in Christ are still underneath the floodwaters. And you start, you know, making these, these, these points of connection that are also in good literature. So you read great books and you're like, why is a book considered a great book? And so the postmodernists would say it's a great book because, you know, crusty old white men got into a, a room in the back of the university and said, these are the great books. This is why it's great. Well, that's, that's not true. 
the real reason they're great, right, is like Peterson says, is that they've won, they've endured. And the very fact that they've endured says something about them, that they're lasting, so they're worthy of your time. And two, they make connections to each other. So you read like uh, Dante's, you know, Divine Comedy, for example. And if you read it with a commentary, you start to feel really ashamed of your education. <laughs> because you realize that he's, he's making connections to Virgil left and right. You know, the Aeneid, you, you realize he's making connections to the Bible. He's making connections to the politics of the time, uh, politics in Rome, the politics, you know, in, in the Garden of Eden. Like you start, mm -hmm. you start making all of these connections. And that to me is, is, is the, the pinnacle. Like when you, when you live your own life and you realize, wait a second, when I'm just, you know, I could say, well, I felt called to be a priest because I was sitting in a, uh, I was meditating and I saw a table and that was my calling, but that's not true, really. I mean, I, I felt the calling there, but if I was being honest, it was whenever, you know, six years before that, when I was taking communion with my wife and I thought that was just a moment where God was meeting us there and saying, I'm going to heal you. I didn't realize that was a door that we would later walk through. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, I think like you can see, like this is like when the this is like when our when our future arrives, it rewrites our past. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way, and I mean, this is going to sound a bit edgy, but it's kind of, I think it's true, uh, and it's not that controversial to say that the New Testament doesn't rewrite the Old Testament, but it does. It actually does reemphasize things or um, gives permission to Christians to basically reinterpret their meaning. And that's, well, I mean, the, that's the road to Emmaus. I mean, that's exactly, isn't that exactly what Christ told the, the, the there, disciples? Yes, Karen, Emmaus? that's so, yeah. okay. So this is, it. so that's the, the perfect reference to, I think, to describe what you're talking about, your levels of, of knowledge of, and then the highest level being your participation, right? Because right there, you have Jesus giving a Bible study, uh, <laughs> you know, because that's what the resurrected Lord does. He just decides mm -hmm. to have a Bible study um, about everywhere that he is in the, in the Old Testament. And they don't see him. And mm -hmm. then it's not until he's breaking the bread at their table that they suddenly have scales fall from their eyes and they see him. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's, there's a good example of propositional truth at work. There's a good example of, you know, Jesus is making those connections. We need, and we need to make those connections, right? It's not, not important. Okay. Um, but then ultimately he leads them to the place of participation and that's whenever they can see him. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's a really good example of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever heard of Henrietta Mears. No, never. Mm -mm. She was a saint back in the, I want to say, and when I see, you say saint, I just mean someone who loved Jesus and lived, lived the life, you know? Um, right. But she wrote a book, she was a Sunday school teacher, and she had a tremendous impact, particularly on young men mm. in this Sunday school class. And so, so she ended up writing a book about what she was teaching in that Sunday school class. And it's called, um, um, <laughs> the, the name of the book just evaporated, but, but the whole yeah. book is about how to find Jesus in oh. every book of the Bible nice um through through the bible no that's that's uh j vernon mcgee but um i probably have a copy of it right not easy to find i guess i read i reorganize my <laughs> my <laughs> office and that's always a bad thing to do um mm -hmm. But anyway, Henrietta Mears, and that it, it's a wonderful old book. I mean, the book is from probably almost 100 years old now. Wow. But it goes through every book of the Bible and it shows where Christ is in every book wow. of the Bible. And um, that had I love a, that stuff. That had a I transformative love. impact on me as a young Christian. I know. That would be like that would be like catnip for me right now. Yeah. I mean, I'd just be <laughs> all over it, you know. Um it's, it feels like we're invited to do that very thing. Like it, we, a lot of Christians miss out, I think, when they don't do that, when they don't go back and read the Old Testament and find Christ. It's like, what, what, is it, what is it that you think we're, we're doing here, you know? And it's, it's a, people miss out. I mean, of course, I think this would be a good way to maybe segue to the Harry Potter thing. I'm not sure, but 
you know, this is a good way to, to say, like, also, I think we're invited to find Christ in the world. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not just scripture it, that we find Christ in, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, but also, like, I think, I think God can speak to us through the written word, through books, through, through stories, because he's the one who told the original story. Um, this is sort of a, 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 a different piece, I mean, maybe not a part of the conversation we need to have or what you want to have, but I mean, I'm just, just right now, I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, the book of Genesis emerges at a time where like a lot of Babylonian narratives are very popular. And mm-hmm. so you have this, you have this sense that God is very much um, invested in the battle between narratives and that he definitely wants to weigh in. <laughs> on those narratives. And, and actually, so when people say, well, you know, the Babylonian narrative and the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about a great flood. So doesn't that make you think that your story's invalid? And it's like, no, not at all. That, that actually make, that makes me think that there's truth. You can find truth anywhere. I mean, there in, mm-hmm. in all places and all people there, there's something truthful about their experience because that's their human beings made in the image of God. And so, yes, and that points to the fact that there is something called truth yes you know, which exactly. is what we've yeah. lost in in our when, when you said something you said something earlier about finding christ everywhere i that just makes me think before i lose it i want to show you this little film clip it's okay. going to be a, almost five minutes long but Let's do it I, trust me i think it's going to be worth it okay um man i'm excited i did not expect to watch <laughs> film clips with you today yeah. okay so this guy michael levin he is yeah. a uh biochemist, I think, uh, and probably also a physicist, but he's done research in bioelectric signaling inside cells. And the basic thing that he and his group have discovered, I, I think you've probably heard before that DNA doesn't really tell a body how to assemble. It just tells a body how to develop proteins and, and gives instruction to the proteins on how to do things. Mm. But what he discovered is that within cells, as they gather together, you can have a whole bunch of undifferentiated cells, but there will be bioelectric signaling going on between the cells where they kind of talk to each other. And Mm. they'll say, you go over there and be an eye. And this group here, you go over there and be a muscle in the arm. And, you know, telling the cells are talking to each other. Yeah. Well, so so that's kind of some background on him. He's a fascinating guy. You, you ever want to learn a lot of stuff? I mean, he's a good yeah. guy to listen to. But here he's talking about cancer. And I just the bells and whistles went off because I think there's a deep principle here that fits in with everything we've been talking about. Mm. Instead of that, they go off and they basically revert to a single cell kind of existence. They, they be, oh, they, I need to go back a little bit. Okay. One of the things about cancer, the, the, the one way to, to think about cancer is to ask the question, why is there ever anything but cancer? In other words, individual cells like amoebas are extremely competent on their own. They handle single cell level goals quite well. Why do they ever get together to form something like a kidney or a liver? Because when you have when when there's a cancer what you're seeing is a defection from that process you're seeing cells that normally should be working on making a nice organ in or upkeeping a nice organ in an adult instead of that they go off and they basically revert to a single cell kind of existence they 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 basically become like an amoeba they treat the rest of the body as just environment it's like external environment so you can think of that that computational boundary between between self and world can shrink it can grow when a bunch of amoebas, a bunch of amoeba-like cells get together and they build something like an organ or, or a whole body that that computational boundary grows, mm. but it can also shrink because an individual cell can say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not working on this anymore. I'm just an amoeba and I'm going to do what amoebas do. What do they do? They, they become two amoebas and two amoebas become four and so on. They over proliferate and they go where life is good. So they metastasize to wherever they, where they, wherever they want to go. So that's, so, so that's cancer. So so if you think about it that way, that, that cancer is this, is this like defection from multicellular cooperation, you can, wow. you ask yourself, okay, so what is the process that normally keeps them harnessed towards specific goals? And 
and so if you ask yourself what what do, what what do we know that's a process that harnesses individual competent subunits towards larger scale goals that's very clear that's that's uh, the neur neural like processing because you have individual neurons which are cells but you connect them together into a network and this amazing computation starts to take place that can do things like plan for the future and have memories and have preferences and goals on a large scale you know, you as an organism can have goals and memories that your individual cells don't have. So, so we know that electrical networks are really good at binding small competent subunits into larger scale computational agents. We do, we, we take advantage of that in computer science. We take, evolution takes advantage of it in, in, in making neurons. So, um, so we asked the following question, okay, could that be the basis of cancer? And now I must say that of course, we're not the first to have this idea. Okay, again, Harold Burr um, had this, said this in the 30s. But so we did, we did three things. We said, okay, first of all, when this process happens, can you see using the voltage dyes, can you see the cells defecting from the electrical network? And in fact, that's the, and in fact, you can. So what you can, what you can do is you, before it happens. So, so you can inject a human oncogene, which is going to form a tumor in a tadpole. You inject that into, um, you inject that into a, uh, uh, into a tadpole. They make a, um, they make a, they make a, you know, it makes a tumor. And even before that tumor becomes, uh, becomes apparent, you can, uh, you can see with a voltage dye, you can see that those cells become, become highly depolarized. They electrically uncouple from the rest of the tissue. And they go on their way and they just treat to them the rest of the animal is just external environment at that point so they become electrically uncoupled and that's that's the first thing that that oncogenes do is electrically isolate the cell from its neighbors from that collection of uh, of, of signals that normally tell the cell what to do in a larger context so that's the first thing we did the second thing we did we said well if that if that's a potential cause of cancer could we uh could we could we cause cancer but just by disrupting the electrical communication directly, no onc no oncogenes, no carcinogens, no DNA damage, no mutations, nothing wrong with the cells that any molecular biology uh, test could see. And could we still could we cause cancer? Because because remember the standard model in the field for years has been that cancer is the cause of a, of genetic damage, basically, right? That it's the, that it's a genetic disruption that makes a rogue cell that has other mutations and so on. So we said, fine, no, we're going to take completely normal cells, nothing wrong with them, and we're going to simply prevent them from talking to other cells electrically. Okay, we're just going to manipulate that. And so we did that, and sure enough, we made metastatic metastatic melanoma in tadpoles. So, so that tells you that you do, there doesn't have to be anything wrong with the hardware in order to have cancer. It, you, it can be a purely physiological phenomenon. It can be caused at the software level, which a lot of people who study stress-induced cancers and things like this, they kind of already knew, but, but, but really the paradigm has been that there has to be a genetic defect at the, at the root of this somewhere. Okay. And then the third thing we found, which is of course the most exciting thing, which is you can go in the opposite direction. You can you can inject a really powerful human oncogene, like a p53 mutation. Oncogene, for those who are listening, is just a gene that causes cancer. Yeah, an oncogene is a is a is a mutation in a in the normal gene that causes that that are that is that is thought to cause a, a cancer transformation to cancer. Yeah. Okay. So so you can inject that, and then if you do that into into a tadpole, if you at the same time inject an ion channel that forces the cell to remain in an electrical state where it's uh, connected to its neighbors and it doesn't depolarize, then even though that oncogene is blazingly strongly expressed, there's no, there, there, you, you, won't, you, won't have a, you won't have a tumor because you're overriding that there's a hardware problem, but it doesn't matter because you're overriding it and saying, yeah, I know you want to depolarize, but you can't. You have to stay connected to these neighbors and you're just going to be part of this. And, 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 and we can override that way a variety of, of different, uh, different types of oncogenes. <laughs> just blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> I do. I do. I like listening to people who speak a different language than me, even when it's also English. So it's like... Yeah. But I'm just, I mean, I'm just but what to, to me, going. what he's talking about is community and the yes. power of community, right? And yes. the, the, the devastation of the nihilism that goes off on its own and starts proliferating. Well, there's something, there's something here, and this is like my hobby horse. I just love trying to get people to understand the value of reading and reading widely. It's like, I just love that. So, and I have a pretty good classes collection for that reason at home. And my wife would tell you how 
there's 25 books right now, just 25 boxes full of books. And that's really annoying. But anyway, um, you seem to take up so many boxes when you're moving. What is that all about? Well, it's, I'd say what it's like, it's like greatness. Uh, no, no. Um, so we, and we, every time we move, we always count because it's like a running joke. It's like 15 boxes last time, 25 boxes this time, you know? Um, but again, it's, it's, you could, that to me could be like talking about cancer. And I don't know if you're trying to go this direction with it. It's like talking, it's like using cancer and the process of the molecular structure as like a metaphor for like how we understand ourselves and how we understand how people break down and are destroyed or are restored and renewed. And mm -hmm. there, you know, I don't, it's, it's interesting, right? Like you look in the, um, the debates around salvation and whether or not you could lose the salvation that you have, or it will never be gone. It'll never be, you know, it'll, no matter what you do in your life, after you are saved, you're always in, you know? And sometimes I think those questions are wrong. Like the, the way we approach the question is really weird. I think the question should in return to someone who's asking that kind of question that's more theological would be, well, are you a part of a body? Mm -hmm. Like, are you even part of a people? Um, called a church like do you even exist in that space because I've seen so many people especially so many peers who just five years ago were so passionate full of purpose and meaning and joy and excitement and experienced the same powerful things that I know we all experience in in in, in Christ miracles I mean talk about the mystical invading our reality, like just ridiculous. I mean, limbs growing out, like the craziest stuff you can imagine happening. You would think those people would never leave the faith. They would never do that. And then they, they, you know, the, the charismatic church we all grew up in didn't prepare us with the proper institutional uh, heft to resist mm -hmm. a secular society. It's too powerful. Mm -hmm. So we realize that personalism doesn't work and just emphasizing a personal relationship with Christ doesn't really work anymore. If that's all mm -hmm. you say, it's important, but it's not the only thing because all those people realized when secularism got turned up to, to like a thousand percent, I guess about six years ago or five years ago, uh, they realized they didn't have the ability to resist and they, but they had a personal relationship with God. So that was enough. And that cancer spread and metastasized, became something unbearable, and they just cast, they end up casting Christ off. And I'm not, I'm, I think it's a perfect metaphor for what happens when people really like, quote unquote, fall away. It's that they truly did experience the connection between them and God and the community uh, mm -hmm. for years. I'm sure they really did. Um, <clears throat> and so the same thing happens with like reading, I think, you know we have a whole generation of students who are, you know, publicly are educated in these public school systems. And, and I have a lot of, I was in the public, you know, I was a teacher in the public school. I have a lot of friends that are doing that, that are doing great work in those systems. But at some point you have to recognize, okay, is the system we're working with conducive to growth and transformation? Or are we creating these, some like these hyper-focused neuro, you know, cells that become hyper-focused on one thing that eventually they metastasize and become something really detrimental to themselves. I think the answer is probably yes. That people who well, go I mean, get if, educated if you stop now, and think about that example of the cell yeah. <clears throat> that says, in the way he, he phrased it right there, he just said the, cells, the, the cell says, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. I'm going to go off on my own and, yeah. then, and start proliferating my own ideas. Well, the I'm not doing this anymore. That that's the idea of this is getting too hard. There's yeah. either there's too much expectation on me, or I'm being expected, or or I I know that I need to be in order to hold on to this faith. I need to stay committed to this group of people. They're irritating me. I don't like what they're saying. Um, the Bible is showing me things about myself that I don't like. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just so many things that happen that can cause a person to say, I'm not doing this anymore. You, you talked about it yourself. You had the experience of falling into the abyss. And at that point you said, 
maybe God isn't faithful. Maybe I've been believing a lie. And, and so why am I doing this? And, and if you had, at that moment, if you had said, I don't need to stay close to the fire in order to keep my coal alive, I can just go off on my own and do my own thing, right? Yeah. You end up being a, a, a burned out ember and you're out there in the cold world all by yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, so, well, and we get like these networks then of people form networks of community after that of people just like them mm -hmm. that think exactly like they do and see the world just as they, as they see it. And those cancerous cells, they become, I guess the, the best way to say it would be like tumors, like, you know, uh, places where no life exists. There's no light. There's just people feeding off of other people. And that that's true. Well, I and, think the, and that's exact. That's yeah. exactly why Jordan Peterson says abandon ideology. Yeah. Because what happens when you go off Determine. and then start hanging around with people who only see the world exactly the way you see it yeah. is that you've lost all innovation, all creativity, all energy. And you just sit there telling each other the same story over and over and over again. Right. You got, you, yeah. You learn once you learn the language. That's why he says, you know, once you learn the language, you've you've arrived. That's a problem. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I just learn the lingo and that is the key to my participation, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, and if I cannot, um, if I cannot imagine another way of doing things, then I am uh, a slave to an ideology. And that that's the problem with the solely propositional church, right? Or the solely personalist right. church, whichever, whatever avenue they go down, that would come just one thing, then that's a problem. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's well said. I do. Um, yeah. It, it's... <laughs> It's why when people look at me and, and, you know, now that you've heard some of my story, it's like, it doesn't really make sense if you go, okay, you went from this to Lakewood to this, like, it doesn't, that doesn't really compute. And then I have to go, well, it's, it's, well, you'll, I'm telling you, whenever you fall into the abyss to use what you're, the, you know, use a phrase or a word you've been using, when you fall into that place, you'll grab for things that give you life really like mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah. And it won't, you won't have to have it all explained right away before you do so. I think there's you a know? verse. I'm not sure if it's in the new Testament or in the old, the treasures hidden in darkness. Yeah. He will tell you when, when he has that intimate relationship with you, he will, he will give you the treasures hidden in the darkness and, and you don't find the treasures until you're in the darkness. <laughs> You know, it's just, yeah. I mean, yeah. Jesus had to be a dead for three days. I mean, he was in the ground, like he is experiencing the darkness himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is part of our journey and our story. We cannot look away from it. That's why we have Lent every year. You know, we're, it's not because we, you know, we want to spend 40 days thinking about how awful we are and just, you know, groveling, you know, before the Lord. Well, no, it's because we're, we're realizing that part of our journey is Israel's story too. We had to go through the desert. The Exodus story is, is not just Israel's story. It's my story. You know, it's your story. It's, that's part of who we are. That's the story we tell our kids and we tell our, each other because we are, we are participating in that story all the time. And so, yeah, I agree with that. I think we have to, we have to uh, enter into that. Uh, otherwise, there's just gonna, it's just going to compound. It's going to get worse. And I mean, some, and it maybe it's hard to say. It's like, it's true. Sometimes following Christ does destroy your life. <laughs> Sometimes following Christ, like does, uh, it is going to be the worst thing in the moment. Like it could be in a, in a sense, and only in this sense, it's disruptive. So like, there are plenty of people who had great lives, you know, had all the money, had all like the opportunity. And then they followed Christ. They decided to follow Jesus and they realized that, they had to walk through hell to get to the other side. And sometimes for, for some people, like that doesn't look in the moment to be great. It looks worse, far worse. Uh, but that's because you have to go through it. And so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it can be difficult, but it's worth it. It is worth it. So I think Peterson telling people to make their bed or, you know, to not be afraid of suffering. I mean, it's one thing to suffer because you are forced to suffer through somebody else. Someone forces you to suffer. You're in an internment camp. 
you know, uh, you, you know, your your Alexander Solzhenitsyn, like just put in there because you made a joke about Stalin's mustache and to, you know, you're just forced to suffer. That's one level. But there's actually an even deeper reality that as Christians, especially, we're actually called to go and to choose suffering. To actually choose the difficult thing. Right. That's what Christ does. He chooses suffering. He chooses to do to endure the difficult thing. Um, and then, of course, suffering is imposed upon him by outside me, by outside forces. But, but this is the, to me, this is freedom. That's like, that's true freedom. That you're able to say no to sin, but not just say no to sin, but to say yes to like the difficult thing. To say yes to that. To say, I'll, I'll, I'll enter into the place where it's really difficult. I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'll say yes to that. And I think that's whenever, I think the most amazing, incredible, uh, life-giving things happen it's on the other side of that and so i guess if enough of us do it we'll we'll probably see some really cool things before we die because because we're gonna, well, you know, I we're mean, gonna die it's, it's exactly like you said though that um we we are not prepared for that in our world today at all i mean when i'm, I'm reading on the incarnation when he gets to the part about the resurrection his his proof his first proof for the resurrection is with what joy all the believers face death in the That's arena, right. right? That's right. Right? Yeah. That they yeah. can trample on death. They can walk right into it because of the joy they have in Christ. That yeah, they, they can look yeah. like being a Christian is like the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Yeah, you're going right? to die. <laughs> yeah. And you're That's not just going to die. You're going to die in the most painful and humiliating way that you can conceive of. And uh, a human being, human beings found the best, the most painful, destructive way to kill other human beings. And yet they don't have power over these people. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. I mean, that I think it's a great, it's a, it's a really interesting argument that he makes there. Uh, because, the, you know, you have the stories of Christians marching to the Colosseum to go die. And everybody around them notices that they're so full of joy, like you said, so full of joy and passion and love that the people watching them end up just giving themselves to the march, mm -hmm. you know, and getting in line with them, choosing to die because of their witness. So again, it, it's like what I said, I said earlier, you know, people are not attracted to our worship. They're attracted to Christians. They're attracted to us, the brightness within us because we worship, you know, it's a perfect example um of what we're talking about but well and and one of the things i really do like about jordan peterson is his his thing to speak the truth yeah regardless of what consequences it brings because that's that's where the sticking point is going to yeah. come for us as a people i think is are we going to be able to speak the truth even when it becomes hard right i heard him say something similar one time where he said um and I haven't listened to Peterson in a long time. So this is probably the I'm just paraphrasing. He says um, that the the great the best outcome in any situation is the outcome that it, uh, as a result of speaking the truth. Yes. So that even if you you suffer and there's pain because you spoke the truth, it is still better than the lack of, the absence of that pain because you did tell the truth. And therefore, you did not lose yourself and go off and become metastasized and viral. You know, mm -hmm. you stuck to you stayed connected to that which is permanent. You you attached your impermanence to your per, to what that which is permanent. Um, and in a sense, to bring it in with, even full circle, like you you spoke the word, the incantation. And so that's to me, that's what we're talking about. Is like yeah. you chose you chose the, the the truth. You chose the the permanent thing. In spite of, in spite of the uh, the alternative, so. So there's the, there's the two sides of that. Well, there's probably a thousand sides. Like you know, you yeah, you read you read the postmoderns. There's a thousand sides to everything. But, but the two that yeah. yeah, the two that pop out <laughs> to me are um, that yes, in speaking the truth, you go through suffering, and that suffering transforms you. So that's so that's good. Hmm. Okay, but. Yeah. The truth also is doing a work somewhere that you have no idea what what work that truth is doing. 
that truth is percolating out into the world and accomplishing God's task. Because like he says, his word never goes forth and, and comes back void. Every place that his word goes, it's doing his work. Hmm. So, um, so I, I think that there just so much happens when you speak the truth, which is why the enemy tries so hard to prevent us from speaking the truth. Yeah. But before we lose the thread, and I know you don't have all day to talk about this, <laughs> I did want to hear what you think about Harry Potter, how you see the story of Christ showing up in Harry Potter. Um, well, I, I mean, I think this and is... I, I have a can... full, full confession. I have never yeah. read any of the Harry Potter books. I had a daughter. I have a daughter who is a big Harry Potter fan. And so... I sat through a lot of the movies with her, but I've never mm. read the books. So, okay. So would you say you're, um, did you, you raise your kids to be, to be open to reading books like that? Or were you at one point antagonistic or? Um, let's put it this way. I was never antagonistic to it. Be, well, with the, so my first daughter, there's 24 years between my girls. Oh, wow. Yeah. So with the first daughter, there was no Harry Potter around or anything, but but I was, I became a believer when she was nine years old. Hmm. Um, and shortly after I became a believer, my husband also came into the faith. And then a uh, few weeks after that, we sent her to a summer camp and she made a profession of faith at the summer camp. So, so here hmm. we are, it's 1980. That was the year, right? We've all, we're all in this little country church, but and, and some of my listeners know this story. We ended up being missionaries in Japan. And while wow. we were there, um, it's a long story with a lot of interesting twists and turns. But my husband told me that he was gay and he was leaving me after 20 years of marriage. So, um, so I ended up coming back to the United States. And um, a few years after that, I met and married the man I'm married to now. And um, then we had a child. So there's 24 years in between these two girls. So the second girl is of a different generation. And when she was in school, Harry Potter was all the rage. But she was in a little Christian school, which wasn't promoting Harry Potter as a, as a method of reading. It was a little Anglican school. Mm. So they're learning, you know, a lot of really good literature and uh, getting good classics and good teaching mm. like that. I just didn't bring it up to her. I didn't buy any of the books for her. I didn't encourage her. So she just never ran into it until she was, I want to say 10 or 12, maybe a friend bought her a Harry Potter for her birthday hmm. and she just devoured it. And then after that, she was reading all of them, you know? So I yeah. tried to hold it loosely because I didn't want to impose too much rigid structure because you know, I didn't want to turn her against. And I, I don't even know what I was thinking. I probably wasn't <laughs> thinking enough, wasn't thinking anything. But anyway, she ended up reading all the Harry Potter books and is a mm. great fan of them. And yeah. uh, and she introduced me to the movies. So we watched quite a few of the movies together. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, I, uh, it's, I always like to ask that question before I make the case. I, I don't really, I'm not an apologist for uh, Harry Potter, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, no one pays I'm me to introduce do that. you as Father John Beadle, the not apologist. For yeah, the Potter. not apologist. That's great. That's a good way to describe it. No. Um, so I, I was, I never, so I, I would say my parents are probably indifferent, leaning towards antagonistic. Mm -hmm. um, if I had any interest in reading, maybe that would have come up, but I just didn't care about reading as a kid. So it never really came up. Mm hmm. But my wife grew up in a, she, she's a, a daughter of a Baptist pastor, and yet she grew up reading them over and over and over again. So when we got married, I guess about almost eight years ago now, um, it'll be eight years this June, or yeah, June. That's right. That's right. Uh, don't watch this, Lauren. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, you know, eight years ago, we get married and we start, you know, combining our things and then you know, I, I have like wall, a wall of books and my wife is not much as much of a reader as I am, but when she takes out all of her books, she wants to put on that wall. I'm like, there's little rinky dink paperbacks 
Harry Potter, you know, the scholastic ones, like the really, no, the blue, yeah, the scholastic editions of these, the American editions of these books. I'm like, what? I mean, don't kids read this? She's like, you should read these books. They're amazing. And I'm like, yeah, but it's middle grade fiction, wish fulfillment fantasy. I don't care. And I'll just throw them, like, I just, I don't care. I kind of an elitist attitude about it for a long time. And then finally, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to read these, these things because I, I love the movies. Uh, I had seen all of those. So I knew how it ended. I was like, I'll just read them and see if I can get something else out of this. And I burned through the first three within like weeks. I mean, very quickly. Um, and then I read the fourth one and I put it down. And I had to put the series down for like a year. I just had the things I was reading. And I guess right about book five and then into book six and seven, I started really noticing patterns and and uh and connections in the last three and then after i finished the last book it was just like i was like in tears like this is so good i can see why people read these books um it's so beautiful um the story is really quite incredible uh the character development is 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 really what draws you in the, the prose gets better over time um it's not that great. So it's not like reading Nabokov or like somebody, you know, who's like a master at prose, but because the ideas and the story is so great, it sort of carries you through the first half of the, the, the series before they, before she really like starts writing in a way that's like really compelling in my opinion. Okay. But I would say this, Harry Potter does not exist without Christianity. Um, there, there would be no Harry Potter if there were no Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I like to say that because, uh, uh, you know, I do think there is a negative side to Harry Potter that people do have to watch out for, but it is not what people typically say is the reason it needs to be watched out for. So when people make the typical arguments about witchcraft and how we shouldn't celebrate that and be careful, I just go, yeah, but, that, but the problem with that is, is that she's clearly part of a tradition a very English tradition of fantasy writers that had a very high view of magic expressed through, you know, fairy stories and fantasy uh, tellings of like reality. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to throw out rolling, uh, Rowling, you're need, you need to throw out uh, C.S. Lewis and you need to definitely throw out J.R.R. Tolkien. I mean, for sure. Um, and in many ways, J.R. Tolkien would be would be more offensive if you think of it, think of magic in that way, in that a kind of offensive way. Uh, I, I can get to that in a second. Um, but I guess I, uh, some background would be helpful. Like people d didn't realize for the longest time that the author herself is a Christian, um, albeit a very liberal one. Um, but she was attending a Church of Scotland church while she was writing these books, and now she's a member of uh, I think the. The Anglican Church in Scotland, I think it's the Scottish Episcopal Church is what it's called. Um, she is an, uh, a member of a, of a Scottish Episcopal Church, so she's an Anglican. Um, and so in that tradition, you start to see, especially in the last book, is where she really just puts all of her cards on the table. And you, it's, it's so evident that it's a Christian story. To the point, I did research before uh, this conversation, it was, so, it was so direct and so clearly a retelling of the Christ story uh, the, that she even said in, in these different press interviews that if people had just read the New Testament, they would have known the ending to her story. That it was so, it was so clearly a story that was mirroring like Christian realities. And so she even goes as far to say in one of her interviews, I don't, I don't, she says, I believe in God, not magic. I mean, she goes as far to say that. Um, so the first, there's the themes and then the actual things that happen in the story that confirm what I'm saying is true. Um, and then the third piece of this, Karen, we could, we could definitely go into it. And I, I have time, I can go into this, is some of the things that are really problematic about Harry Potter that are different than what has been advertised, okay? Mm -hmm. so it's not like it's not, it's not like it's perfect. So the, the themes themselves are deeply Christian, Okay. So you have the 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 the, the story of, of good versus evil is so clear throughout the you know see them in the films, uh, the where the the victim becomes the heroic force in the story, um, that is only a story told by Christianity. Um, you can read the pagan uh, literature and get a lot out out of it. You can read Beowulf and you can get a lot out of it. The victim is not the hero. 
okay? Uh, the victim, but the victim becomes a heroic force because of Christ. We only know stories really like that because of the Christian story. And we as a society have been conditioned so well by the Christian story that we hear a story about, you know, an orphan child whose parents were killed while he was but a baby. And we go, yeah, he's going to be the hero. Like we just know it, you know, and like in, we intuit it. Um, the victim becomes the heroic force. Um, the, the force of evil in the stories themselves operates the way evil does today. So in other words, evil, experiencing evil, uh, it, it inspires fear. Fear leads to silence and propaganda. And so people either don't talk about the problems or uh, that they're experiencing, or they make up stories that explain what's happening without having to actually look at the force itself. And then um, the other th the themes of good versus evil, like goodness itself find its, finds its strength, not in the expression of magic or saying the right words, really. You see this in the story that goodness finds its expression in family, friendship, and community. So that's the, the continual theme that runs throughout Harry Potter of good and evil is, is there's this continual expression of goodness that pushes back against evil that Vold Lord Voldemort, like the great evil satanic character of the story, is evil in part because he does not experience community and friendship. And that's, that's made apparent in book, uh, I want to say it's book five uh, with the Order of the Phoenix. Is that great revelation where Harry is, is scared that he himself is going to become like the Lord Voldemort. He is frightened that his anger and his rage is going to turn him into the very thing that he hates. And then there's that amazing moment where he realizes that in the, in the moment where, you know, uh, Dumbledore, you know, who's sort of like the, the Gandalf figure in Harry Potter uh, confronts Voldemort magically when he is victorious and Voldemort has to disappear. There's that great moment in the movie as well, where Harry is hearing Voldemort speak lies to him in his mind. And he's able to overcome, not through really through magic, but he's able to overcome through the realization that he has friends and they love him and he loves them. And that he actually has pity on his enemy in that moment. And that's where he overcomes. So even the expression of pitying those who participate in evil is a very Christian ideal and Christian thing. And the other thing too is, is there's two, two other, well, I've already gave, given away the ending, but um, the idea of an alternative society that runs parallel with the, the dominant society is also, in my, you know, in my view, a very Christian thing. Um, imagine that, if you will, there is a group of people who exist parallel to the other group of people who know what's really going on. Uh, and so that is it also a very, I mean, that's the church, right? We know that there's a war, there's a good and evil like battle happening in the spirit realm. And we exist in part to, uh, to protect and also to en enliven and, uh, and open the eyes of those around us who, who don't know about that reality. So that to me is a very Christian idea. Of course, people can say, well, that's cults. Cults operate similarly. Yes, that's true. Uh, cults do that. But that's not that does not negate the real. You know, if you have a fake twenty dollar bill, um, that doesn't tell you that that twenty dollars does not exist. It just tells you that it's a copy. You know, it's a false image. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, I think those are some of the major themes that clearly uh, say it's a that it's a Christian story. But some of the more interesting details that prove that I mean, Harry has a godfather. You know, <laughs> he has a godfather named Sirius Black. Sirius Black. You know. It's like Harry's parents, we know through the story, christened him right after he was born, okay? Um, he has godparents. I like to say Harry Potter is an Anglican Christian, all right? Just to be clear, <laughs> he's Anglican, all right? Um, <laughs> you know, on the Dumbledore's uh, siblings, you know, they have, he, in the movies, they show this too, but in the books, uh, their graves are visited and on their tombstones are scripture, right? One says, where your heart will be, there your treasure will be also, and then I, I believe one of one of the other tombstones talks about uh, the conquering of death. And so there you start realizing that Harry's birth is like a retelling of the incarnation itself. OK, let's let's back up for a second. So 
Harry, when he's born, he's born to two parents who are in the middle of a battle. They are in the middle of a fight. And then he's confronted. So the Voldemort comes in and spoiler alert, kills Harry's parents before he can ever actually get to know them. But Harry, he tries to kill Harry. Harry survives. And we find out later the reason that he survives is because he gets that, that lightning bolt scar on his forehead because uh, Voldemort doesn't realize that he has implanted a piece of his soul and he's made Harry into what's called a Horcrux, which is where the evil one has to put pieces of himself so he doesn't fully perish, right? So he can achieve immortality. Um, so that, that, that in itself is a, a theme that is also, I think, Christian, although the, the idea of, you know, Christ is not, he's not marred by the stain of sin, so I'm not saying that. But whenever he's born he, and he survives, um, if you read the books, they, there are moments where the mug, like where I want to say it's Dumbledore goes around telling muggles who, re who represent like regular people without magic that today they should rejoice. They should rejoice in his birth. So there, again, you, you have moments like that where that mirror the Christian story in these really powerful ways that Rowling is clearly her imagination is steeped in the Christian tradition. You know, mm -hmm. this is clearly not an imagination steeped in the Eastern tradition or in the African tradition. Um, you know, she's not, I mean, there are elements of those traditions in the story, but the dominant story is one influenced by the West and by uh, Christianity in particular. Um, I mean, there, there are just so many different examples. Uh, uh, that 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 you can find if you actually read closely and carefully that she's hidden so like even i heard peter speaking of peterson he made a reference to uh, the chamber of secrets you know book two uh being jk rowling's retelling of saint george and the dragon you know uh because harry quite literally gets a sword that defeats the dragon i mean it, it's it's like it's so evident that there are not only biblical stories being told here in this in this narrative, but there's also stories of saints that the church has always told about its its spiritual life um, that are being told uh, here in this story. And uh, and you know, with that in mind, I mean, Christians who who hold themselves back from the stories because of the, its use of magic or its reference to witchcraft in a positive sense. I would say, take a step back, realize your own tradition, realize the, the tradition you're a part of in the West that is steeped in fairy stories, and, and don't be afraid of that. Um, Chesterton said, I, I have the, the quote here, I was going to read it, if that's okay. Yeah, Can I read this absolutely. quote? Yeah. Okay, so let me pull it up. Um, Chesterton very famously said this, he said, Fairy tales do not give the child his first idea of like the boogeyman, he says, right? So evil. What fairy tales give the child is that his first clear idea of the possible is the possible defeat of the boogeyman. Uh, the baby has known the dragon intimately ever since he had an imagination. But what the fairy tale provides for him is a St. George to kill the dragon. Um, there's another version of this quote that I'm going to read very quickly. That is Neil that Gaiman used. Oh, I, I thought that was C.S. Lewis. I, I thought I also read a C.S. Lewis quote that kind of tells the same. Very similar. Uh, <clears throat> the one that I, I had heard that Chesterton said this next quote, but actually it was Neil Gaiman misinterpreting or misreading Chesterton, but basically saying the same thing. So I th this is pretty great. He says, fairy tales are more than true. Not because they tell us dragons exist, but because they tell us dragons can be beaten. Hmm. So... I would turn that onto the world, into the world of Harry Potter and the lore of Harry Potter and say, what makes Harry Potter interesting is not its use of magic or witchcraft or any of that. These are just like bells and whistles of like the same fairy stories we've always heard. What makes Harry Potter interesting is that it tells us that evil can be defeated, that friendship can transcend uh, the machinations and the, the, the witchcraft of the, the, of the darkness and that the victim does triumph in the end. And so ultimately this is a Christian story. It should be read as a Christian story. It is only truly understood as a Christian story. And people who do otherwise are not actually reading it the way that the author really intended or are not really honoring the tradition she's a part of. 
And so, again, if you want, if you want to know what, what's in the author's mind when she wrote the series, all the press, you know, coverage that she, you know, the press that she did during the Deathly Hollows book tour gives away, gives away the, the, the story. So that's my big uh, argument for why it is. That was, that was great. That was, that was just great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know. I hope that's not too long. I just. Oh no, not at all. And, and I mean, it's obvious that what you're seeing is that, you know, the, the patterns of action, right. And the story and um, what was yes. the third thing? Oh, and the propositions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then of course, like, this is the thing. It's like, you know, um, I, when I think of Harry Potter, I mean, there are things that are problematic about the story. Okay, there are. But okay. the expression of magic, because this is what really I think got triggered this conversation to begin with, right? I was talking about this aspect of it. Magic revealing reality. Magic revealing reality, right? Is that in that fairy tale fantasy tr Christian tradition, magic is not used... Uh, for its own sake magic is used as an expression of one's participation in reality okay so when you um I, I personally i do have a favorite magic system i prefer tolkien's magic system to, to rowling's magic system personally okay because i think it's more christian if that makes sense i think it's even deeply it's even more deeply christian than rowling's interpretation of magic they fundamentally do the same thing but like, if you look in Middle Earth, the magic is softer. There's a softer magic system at work. And evil is expressed in the way that it uses magic to corrupt nature, right? Whereas the elves who are good, who did not follow Morgoth and go off into whatever, um, they use magic as tools for creating beauty and revealing reality, okay? So that magic is not simply used as a tool to make life better. It is also, it is, it is actually, when it's used as a, purely as a tool, it becomes something evil. It becomes an expression of the darkness. So this is Tolkien's big problem with like the industrial revolution is not that he hates like, you know, uh, making people's lives easier. It's just that the introduction of like the steam engine and, and, and uh, you know, all this technology has it, it's made our lives easier, but it has not made our lives more beautiful. It has made our lives more difficult. And in some ways it's diminished what it means to be human because everything now looks the same. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so like, you know, Harry, a good example is when he's, he's uh, doing the, um, He's releasing his charm upon the uh, like the basically like, they're like the floating um, the floating ghosts. Uh, I forget what they're called. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, and he introduces the the Patronus charm, and the Patronus charm is not something that comes from nowhere, right? It is not a creation. It is Harry realizing he can connect his propositional word like his words with the good feelings about his family and the sense of belonging with the power that's already in him to overcome the soul sucking darkness that he's trying to overcome. Right. So that right there is a really good, I think, you know, it's like, well, in that, if that's what magic is, then like, I want to do that, you know, and we do all, do it all the time, especially as Christians, like we participate in this way. We Christ reminds us that he's put us into a body. He reminds us that he's given us truth to speak and a reality that we can access through that in that way. Um, no. Well, and if I could just yeah. throw this in here, it may, immediately what came to my mind is the very end of that video that I showed you, where they've introduced a cancer cell into yep. into the community of cells. Yeah. But at the same time, they introduce an ion channel that holds that community together, and the cancer cannot take root. Exactly. Now, I don't know if you've ever saw that video about rats. Um, maybe it's Brene Brown that does that work or that, that talked about that. Mm. that <clears throat> there was this guy who tried to create a, a world that would be 
the ideal world for rats and create, you know, give them a ready-made village to live in, basically ready-made space and make it exactly what rats like to be in and everything. <clears throat> but when the rats got up to a certain um, population, for some reason, they just stopped repopulating and then they started to dwindle and everything. I don't remember the, I don't remember the whole experiment but yeah. one of the things that they found with this experiment that came out of it was that rats that are placed in an environment where they can't develop community they end up being the the rats that are addictable and the rats that are in situations where they have community and where they play with each other and they interact yeah. are not addictable you can mm. take a rat that's addicted to something and put them into a community where they can mm. get folded into the community and their addiction will disappear. Mm. Wow. And yeah. And so, so that's exactly the picture that you're talking about here is that it's the, it's really the power of community, which we know in the Christian story is really the power of the Holy spirit working through individuals to build community right which is yes. christ right the body yes. of christ right and, exactly. and, and I mean, that's I where the power resides yeah i agree i think that's very very true it's like um when i talk to young especially young guys about their addictions and they tell me things like i have prayed a thousand times that god would deliver me from this addiction that i'm suffering from and i'm still suffering from it um i just tell them i said well god has provided your has provided your way out. He has, he has worked a miracle, but he's buried that, that treasure, that deliverance in other people. And unfortunately for maybe that person, they have to come to the stark realization that um, they have to get to know others and they have to let people in, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, you can't just expect to do this by yourself. Um, yeah. If you think, I mean, if you think you can, I mean, try it, it'll be, you'll be deformed. It'll be a deformed version of the faith that we know and love. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that because God then it requires our... some kind of coercion or, yep. or, or force, or you have to gut your way through it and it becomes exhausting and you just can't maintain it. Yeah. Which is like how Ro rolling, you know, and, and she interprets evil that way. That, and, and the same thing with Tolkien too. He interprets evil as that which manipulates, that uses power to manipulate objects rather than to, rather than blessing them. So it's this idea that if magic does reveal reality, well, the way that it's done matters, and it, it it'll produce goodness if it's done with the intent to actually see and learn and understand and grow. Mm -hmm. um, but there's the opposite too, you know. I mean, how many people do we know or? walking in miracles and walking in authority and they're in, you know, leaders in churches and they just, they use that power and they use it for personal gain. And it, it creates, it creates its own uh, suffering and, and, and darkness that like, I mean, God, have, Lord have mercy on us, you know, for that. Mm -hmm. And people have to be careful. I mean, truly careful um, with that expression. And, and I don't, you know, and I, just to be clear, I, for your listeners, especially in those who know me and are hearing me say this, uh, like, I don't believe in like, you know, magic per, as it's expressed in like these stories, you know, I don't think mm -hmm. like I can get a special wand and, and, uh, sparks fly out or a wand chooses me or what, you know, I'm not, that's not what we're talking about here though. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not talking about that. Uh, we're talking about, you know, and Rowling's doing this too in her story. She's teaching the reader how to understand the power that comes from within, which can be uh, a story that secular people take into their, you know, we've heard versions of that story without Christ that are not as powerful, kind of like the way the wrinkle in time was adapted in the film. You know, you read, you know, anybody who's read that story knows that the center of that story is the word of God, because she, mm -hmm. the, the power the witch's giver is, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, like passages from the prophets and the Psalms. And then you watch the movie and they're like, no, the, the center of this story is you're an outcast. And now you're like included, like inclusivity, you know, you're now you belong. And it's just like this, it just, well, that's a good message, I guess, but like it totally changes the story. It, it creates something that's not as, as good a value as the original story. And so part of, 
revealing reality means we learn how to accept things that are permanent and as they are and not as they we, we think they should be or we can't in that we you know we can't manipulate it um, mm -hmm. so w would you say that this connects up with some of the um the word of faith movement and the prosperity movements and so forth who yeah. are using the word mm. as a tool right yes I, I i do i i see i've seen it happen i've you know played a part in it somewhat mm -hmm. in my earlier ministry years yeah i think there's well, I, do, I do think there's power in the word and mm -hmm. proclaiming the word over your life um but it's like anything else like you 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 alluded to this earlier it's like if you you can get the propositions right and get the story wrong mm -hmm. right so i think that's the 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 problem with that that whole um movement is like well yeah it says that you know i know the plans i have for you it says the lord plans to prosper you not to harm you to give you hope in the future you know we write that down on like our you know the cards we give to graduates and we say don't ever forget this like write this story write this this statement on your heart and it's like yeah write that statement on your heart but, but remember that in the story of israel like you have a prophet who's saying that who has being utterly rejected and will never, ever, ever, ever in his lifetime experience the fruit of his labor. Never. He will only ever experience suffering at the hands of those he's called to reach. And in his life, his only, uh, his only um, passion, his only um, break from that suffering is in the presence of God. So, Hey, so, uh, you know, college graduate, know the plans he has for you. Know that they are not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. But that does not mean that you will not suffer because you will. Mm -hmm. and, so, yeah. and really, that's partly where the beauty lies, too. So, well, and I think I think the problematic pieces of Harry Potter are, are just kind of clear and you can see it in the culture. You know, when people hold up signs that say, you know, this, this house believes da, 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 and they just start listing off all the propositions. Um, a lot of those people read Harry Potter, you know, that's, that's the sort of Harry Potterfication of our politics and our, our civil society, you know, that I, you can see that happening. Um, and then I, I actually do think that, that Rowling doesn't, doesn't understand magic as well as other writers so there are moments where i'm like uh i don't know about that that kind of seems like you are telling harry that he can say the right words to manipulate his surroundings and his reality and so if anybody really wants like a really good critique of the stories they should go listen to um the bbc uh radio uh, interview that roger scruton gave a long time ago about harry potter where he actually says the, the very thing I'm saying, I, and I'm, I've been persuaded. He's like, if people don't actually understand the story and really like go deep into its Christian roots, they can easily take the story as a statement of, I can learn the magic and learn the right things and impose it upon the world around me. And that'll make things different and the and make things the way I think they should be. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that would be, uh, a more like a more of a criticism of the story if you are not going deeper into its Christian roots, where you have a whole generation of people saying, you know what, all this stuff around us is just a construct. Permanence does not exist. Everything is changing all the time. Therefore, it's up to me to find the, and, and of course, like the only thing that's permanent is like my feelings about myself. I can project that onto the world and make the world I want to see. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that would be, that would be a, uh, that that's you, you hit. I mean, that is the postmodern predicament right there. Yeah. And where I began to see this early in my walk with the Lord, when I, I had only been a Christian about two years and I ended up running. Well, actually I had only been a Christian for a few months and I ended up running for the legislature. Oh, wow. <laughs> and during that, during that election, I was going door to door and trying, I made it my commitment that instead of going door to door just to do political thing, I would meet with and listen to anybody God put in my path. And so 
on that path, I met this family. They were wonderful Christian people and uh, they were word of faith people. And mm. so I loved them and I thought they were interesting people. And one day I went over to their house to visit and they were gathered with a bunch of other Christian believers from their little group. And they were all in tears, standing around mm. in a circle, just, just crying with great passion. Mm. And I said, what has happened? And they said that they had gone out to the farm of a friend who had a sick calf and they had prayed for the calf to be made well and to come back to life. And the calf died. Mm. And it had shaken their faith to the absolute core. Yeah. And so I remember going home that yeah. night and thinking about what they had said and just mulling it over in my mind and thinking that can't, that cannot be right to have that but, perspective because yep. if that is true, then God is not good. So I, I totally believe that God does miracles and that when we pray, things happen. I do believe that. So I'm not yes. a cessationist. I, yes, absolutely. Seen, I believe right. that too. I completely I, right. believe that. Right. But, but, but if, if, yeah. my, if, if there was a baby instead of a calf, oh, yeah. yeah. and if that baby's life depended on my faith being strong enough yep. to pray that baby into right. health, then God is not good because God so, loves that baby more than I do. Well, that's the thing that's so fascinating is like, again, it's this, and I only have language for this whenever I started reading literature, to be honest, I realized that the problem with that movement and maybe the lie those people believe is that, again, if they say the right words, have the right amount of faith, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. There is a, there is clearly, we don't, you know, Paul says in Galatians one, we've been delivered from the present evil age. There's a tension between heaven and earth and not everything always works out the way we think it's going to work. And there's no real answer for it. I mean, I was, uh, I used to take students to Trinidad every summer and we would literally go from church to church doing like these like youth rallies, you know, mm -hmm. and we preach the gospel and lay hands on the sick. That's what we do everywhere we went. And the same thing happened to us, Karen. Like we had this girl who, this uh, girl who was blind in one eye and the students that I brought with me prayed for her for like an hour and nothing happened. And they were like weeping and, and just, you know, just crying out to God, like in the yard next to the church, because they were just so distraught. They were just, 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 just destroyed by this outcome. And the next morning that no one was happy, everybody was still like kind of down in the dumps. And I didn't really have an answer for them. And I didn't really know what to say. And the next night we had a meeting and everybody, like you could tell, they were just like, just bored, just, okay, we're going to do the preaching thing and prayer thing. Nothing happened. Does God even care about these people? Does he even care? You know, the whole things that you can tell that goes going through their head is like, they're really disappointed. Mm -hmm. So we get up to give prayer for anybody who wants it. And we don't feel the Holy Spirit at all. We don't feel full of faith. And this kid who's blind in one eye comes, another kid who's blind, comes up for prayer as a joke. And all of a sudden starts screaming because he can see out of that eye all of a sudden. And it, it's, it's like, how do you explain that? One night we're full of faith and nothing happened. Nothing seems to happen. And then the next night we don't feel full of faith at all. And it does happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing. It's like, we have to escape is this is the bit of Harry Potter. I want to like, you know, escape from is like, you know, sometimes like we just, it ultimately the thing that must rest upon is on the nature of God. He mm -hmm. has to be the one who defines what is goodness. What is, what is, what is healing. Um, and let him be the one who ultimately is responsible and just say, if it's up to the Lord, he is the one in charge. I just submit to him. I'm old, mm -hmm. I'm sitting to, submitting to ultimate reality itself in God, mm -hmm. and I'm just one who participates. And my participation is weak, it's fragile, and it's not perfect, and it's full of like all kinds of problems. And I'm still working through that. We all are, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, are you gonna? Are we gonna just accept that? 
you know, a negative view and say, well, nothing's going to happen. So why does it not even try? No, I think the, the call of the, of the gospel is to say, no, you need to go ahead and just participate in this way, no matter what happens, because it's not really up to you anyway, mm-hmm. but it's, you have to be the, we have to be ones who say yes to that story. And the only way to participate in that story is to pray for the sick. We have to pray for the sick. Uh, Matthew 10 makes that really clear. So I don't, it's like not everybody I pray for gets healed, but some have praise God. And, but you know, like, it's like that Wayne Gretzky, Gretzky co- uh, quote that Michael Scott quoted in the office, you know, you know, the, the you know what I'm talking about? No. You ever seen the office, Karen? I saw some of it. Yeah. I, okay. I have this thing where I can't watch things where they go south too bad because, I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so my family loves that series completely. Both my husband and my daughter just love, love, love it. But once it starts going south in any episode, I got to leave the room. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it's awkward. It's hilarious. Cause it's awkward. Yes. But yeah. He, he basically quotes the quote, like he puts Wayne Gretzky in a quote and then he quotes himself saying it like on, anyway, it's hilarious, but the quote is true. You've missed hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Now I think we can be, you gotta be careful with that. Cause like, you know, with prayer, it's not like God is ultimately relying upon me mm-hmm. or, you know, my obedience Mm-hmm. But, it, but somehow I, I, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not like totally free will in that sense, but at the same time, it's like, well, you know, I do, I do think when we pray things happen and I, well, and know, plus, I mean, he's, he's giving us the privilege of participating. Yes. First of all. And yes. secondly, um, we are changed in the process as we pray, because somehow, even as, as we try to articulate the words of the prayer, He's rewriting our heart and our spirit and our mind and our emotions yes. so that the prayer comes out differently than it went in. And, and yeah. so all kinds of things happen when we pray that that aren't necessarily tied into the outcome because we mm. leave the outcome in his hands. Right. Because he is yeah. good. That's got to mm. be the bottom line of everything. I think if if you know. This is one of my little pet theories, if you know that God is good then everything that happens, you have a path through every story. If you know that God is good. Mm. Yeah. Because like, I mean, again, to quote Peterson, the greatest outcome of obedience is whatever happens. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because then it's, you have God, Mm -hmm. you're encountering God. And that's, that's, that's enough in itself. Mm Mm-hmm it's the greatest outcome may not be what I anticipate just everything happening exactly the way I want it to happen, you know? And so I think that's the kind of tying it back to what you were saying earlier. It's like, that's what it, that's what it does. It reveals who God is. The prophet Jeremiah doesn't have fruit from man. He has God. Mm -hmm. That is what he has that makes his life valuable. And so even as like a priest, it's like, I don't, the most interesting, interesting thing about me is God. That's it. That's the best thing I can give to anybody is reveal God and help them see God and encounter him. Everything else feels secondary, everything, you know? And so I think that's, and for Christians in general, like we have the most interesting thing about us and it's not us. And that's good news. Mm -hmm. I think it's Psalm 73, where he's talking about how the evil seem to get so much have so many good things going on and and the righteous are, you know, have all these problems. But then at the end, he says, though my flesh and my heart may fail, he is my portion forever. Yeah. Right. It's good. Exactly. So it's like, like, yeah, I mean, like your life is like this, it's so small Mm -hmm. and then everything else, eternity is like this, you know, it's like way out here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's your life is to be spent, you know, it's to be, it's supposed to be buried. It's seed. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have you, are you familiar with the author, Samuel Johnson? You mean way, way, way back when? Oh yeah. Samuel Johnson. Like 18th century, like yeah. author of the dictionary. Uh, so a little bit. I mean, I oh, remember he's... having to read him in college, but I don't think oh, he, so... he wrote some diaries, right? Johnson and peeps wrote diaries. Yeah. The, so yeah, I know peeps did. Um, I don't know if he has any diaries. I don't know, but I, I there's like a there's like a collection of his essays that are in his editorials that are really good. And, and, I and look it up. It's really good. I mean, the 
Oxford puts together a collection of his best, like a t- like you can get like a 600 page kind of taster of like everything that is Samuel Johnson. It's fantastic. Um, anyway, he he has a uh, one short essay in there called "The Limits of Human Achievement," and it is probably the the best defense for why people need Jesus I've ever read, because he says basically this. Imagine every good thing you've ever done in your life. Like, what's a good thing you did this week that you're really proud of, right? You helped somebody out. You gave them money. Like, you said a kind word to someone in, in suf- who was suffering, whatever. Okay. Take one good thing you did. Okay. For every good thing you've ever done in your life, think about all the thousands of things that you've left undone. The things that you didn't do. The things that have not contributed to goodness, truth, or beauty in your life. And that is exactly why that piece of the human condition is exactly why we need the grace of God. We need the incantation of the miracle, the incarnation to be spoken over us every day uh, to truly escape this sort of like this abyss, this void of good works and bad works so that we actually are measured not by what we've done, but by what he has done. Because the most interesting thing about me is Jesus Christ. So that when the father looks at me, he sees his son. That's the best thing about me. Um, Not anything good or bad that I've done. And then, of course, that produces good works. But I'm saying that he makes this really compelling argument for why. I think he's basically saying it because he's tired of rich people. Like, you know, at the time, rich people holding it over the heads of the poor, that they're somehow better or more noble. And he's, you know, Samuel Johnson, sort of the champion of the champion of the poor, the champion of prostitutes and homeless people and debtors prison inhabitants you know he's sort of this christian champion of those who are struggling but very conservative so that makes him really interesting too right because he's a tory (laughs) he's a straight up tory but he's making this argument and it's so i i you know that's what to me is is we need to tap more into that grace i think the grace of god now i'm preaching so now here, I've, I've been preaching this whole time, but here I'm, I'm preaching some more. So just tell me when to stop. But, uh, you know, the grace tempers nature. That's why Lord of the Rings is so good. That's why fantasy literature steeped in the Christian tradition is so good because it, 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 it reflects magic like that. That is also why books like A Game of Thrones or the Song of Ice and Fire series are not as good as Lord of the Rings because the author himself, George R. R. Martin, is not a Christian, and nor does he have a Christian worldview, or if you use Charles Taylor's social imaginary, grace does not temper nature in that story, right? It's just, there's just nature. There's just brutal force. There's just power, right? So the story of Game of Thrones is, is, is if you read the books especially, is like that, where it's, you can see like how there's moments of like gratitude or grace, that happen that are like, Oh, look at that. And then they're like little flowers that just get just trampled on by like a thousand ironclad soldiers. Um, whereas Tolkien's different. He's like, no, no, no. Grace tempers nature. That's the way my system, a magic system works. Um, and that's why I, this is a totally different episode. We could go into one of these days as to why. Let's do it because I think what, what you just said there about game of Thrones. Now I never watched that because I heard about all the brutality and everything. Yeah, But I know that one of the things that gripped some of the people that I, I love and care for who watched that was that every time that this little flower would right, raise up, they would get trampled and squashed. And that was the end of them. And why did they get rid of that character, you know? Yeah. And I think there's something there that is speaking to the postmodern predicament, in which I'm actually reading right now. Um, D.C. Schindler's book, The Postmodern Predicament. I've heard of it, yeah. You familiar with D.C. Schindler? Mm-mm. Oh, I think you would like him. Well, anyway, so I'm reading that book and I think it would be really interesting to talk about that point about, and, and Paul Vanderclay had a really, really great episode this morning on good and evil and heroes and villains and hmm. how that whole landscape is changing in modern movies and media um, because the nature of villains is being twisted in a very interesting way in this postmodern world. I yeah. think that would make a great conversation. So after you get moved and settled, let's do that. <laughs> I'm going to come back on the show. Yeah. 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 I, I would mean, love this that. Has been completely like just off the hook. 
John. Oh, good. I mean, good. I I'm say. glad. <laughs> Can I say one more thing though? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did want to, I wrote it down because so I was like, I want to say this. <laughs> if people really, really want to read a, a great fantasy book that is like, in my opinion, if you're just curious of mm -hmm. the greatest, in my, the, one of the greatest authors to do this, like one of the best examples of what we're talking about with magic revealing reality and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Every single person who watches and listens to your podcast or your show should read uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clark. I keep hearing that and I bought the book, um, but I just couldn't get into it. How long does it take to get into it? <laughs> now, that's the problem. The first 100 pages are like, is this it? Like, what is this? Oh, okay. okay. It, it takes, it's like Lord of the Rings in that way. Like it takes a solid, like at least a hundred pages to really get the world and, and for the world to happen and to get the story going. Okay. But once the, uh, there's a big thing that happens in the very beginning that sets the story in motion. I won't, I won't give it away. It has to do with the fairy that appears not long after that, the story really begins to pick up, but it's sort of, she's written, it's a very English like it's like if Jane Austen wrote about fairies and like evil and it, it's it's a it, it'd be it'd be written like that that would be her book, but it's mm -hmm. it's a, imagine an alternative. Is that the same book. author of Piranesi? Yes. Yes. Oh okay. Gosh. Yeah. So I read Piranesi. Such a good book. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And and the the one I just started reading um, because I was encouraged to. And this is something we could talk about too. Is David yeah. Bailey Hart? Yeah, I'd like to hear more of your your views about David Bentley Hart. But anyway, he wrote this fantasy book called Kino Gaia. I heard about that. And I started yeah. reading it yesterday. And I have to say, it's the first book I've read in a long time where I almost didn't want to go to sleep last night because wow. I, I got through about a fifth of it and I had to go to sleep because it was just getting too late. But it it's that enticing. He's He builds a world of magic. Wow. And by magic, I mean just a such a beautiful, a re-enchanted environment. Let's put it mm. that way. You know, there's a lot That's of talk awesome. in our corner of the world about re-enchanting the world. Yeah. He, he's building one of these re-enchanted environments where just as you're reading it, the beauty of the language and the beauty of the environment that he's picturing. And, and of course, the darkness of the evil is yeah. just very gripping and um and so I'm going to keep seeing it, it pops up in my recommendations today. almost daily. So I need to, yeah. I need to finally just get it. Um, well, and I'm yeah, going to go back like, and once I finish that, I'm going to go back and try to plow through Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Because... You need to. And the, the series that on the BBC that came out a few years ago is fan is excellent as well. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So good. And the, um, the guy that plays Jonathan Strange is, is like, is so compelling uh his portrayal of the character i mean i think he he gets it right i mean all, all the characters all the actors that play those characters i feel like they just nailed it when they got they got the right actress to play those parts um but again it's it's like you're saying that that this david bentley Hart book is about is like the re-enchantment of the world is happening that mm -hmm. is quite literally the story because magic used to exist it's faded out over the last couple hundred years in england this is like 19th century napoleonic war time and it's coming back you know everything's becoming re-enchanted again. It's just excellent. But in this case, mm -hmm. the Jonathan Strange one, I'm sure the same case, the same as the case with David Bentley Hart, it's a very Christian story. Mm -hmm. Very, very Christian. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but I get what you're saying though. She, she writes it in a very Victorian, high Victorian style. So it's kind of, it can be kind of stuffy and, it, and yeah, kind of hard I, to get into. I mean, into. Piranesi was a lot easier for me to get into because Piranesi so, is just building this, building this yeah. world that's just immediately accessible you we know? could all you know what you and i could almost do an entire episode on these books <laughs> like <laughs> well, like i could talk about piranesi <laughs> for hours because i you know reading that book I, I read that one before i read jonathan strange and i was totally hooked i was like thinking about um i won't i won't spoil anything but i was thinking like the silver chair the whole time was going through my head and like hmm. a little bit of a, the platonic you know, Plato, uh, Plato's cave thing that C.S. Lewis reworks with the silver chair in the Narnia stories. I was just I, thinking about the silver chair the other day as being a metaphor for wh where we are today. So true. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. 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 
I mean, it's a Christianized version of the of the of Plato's cave, right? This idea that you have people who are enslaved and they don't believe that there is a, an above ground because they've never seen it. And then there's people like I love the I love the part where uh, where uh, Puddle Glum is like, you know, he puts his foot in the fire because he says, well, even if you're right, even if there is no Aslan, I would rather live in a world where there is. And so therefore, end of the argument, end of story. Aslan's story is more beautiful than the story you're telling me, therefore it's true. And then boom, you know, there's like the big awakening that happens and everybody's eyes are open once again. <laughs> but, uh, oh my gosh, see, we could just do it. We could just roll into hour three. I mean, if we wanted well, to, but I know I once you <laughs> want, but once you start church planning, you're not going to have very much time. So marshal your time, save it up. We'll do a whole series. Um, but next one is heroes and villains and goodness and evil in media. And then after that, we'll tackle these books because it's going to take me a while to get through Jonathan Strange, I can guarantee. Okay. <laughs> that sounds great, John. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. It's been a true pleasure yeah. and such a joy uh, to be with you. So I'm so glad. Same this here. It's the best okay. thing to come out of Twitter in a long time. <laughs> yes, no kidding. Happy moving day. Okay, take care. Do I log off now or do I just... I'm going to, I'm going to log off and then we're bye-bye.